Okay, guys, let's get started with the lecture today. We will continue talking about networks, and then I want to talk about this weird little thing, why your friends have more friends than you have. In the literature is known as the friendship paradox, but I find it not only fascinating, as you'll see, actually, I did a couple of research on it myself, but I also find this fascinating within this whole context of analytical sociology. Right? Keep in mind that the whole story is, I don't know, we are embedded in social context. That's a macro-level phenomenon on the one side. Then you have individuals, so they are sort of embedded in that. Right? That's sort of like how they experience their world. So obviously that link is important, right? because that determines what I do at the end of the day, which then at the end adds up again to the macro-level. Yeah? So this is sort of where the friendship paradox comes into play. But before I get started, uh, let me mention this. It's time again for the second take home test it's happening and uh, I'm very happy that I was, it was brought to my attention this morning by one of you guys uh, that there actually has been conflicting information in the syllabus uh, I, I hate when that happens yeah um, I hate when that happens to me but it was a mistake on my side so actually on the first uh, at the summary it says that the test will be made available on Blackboard on the 25th of November and you have 72 hours to complete it. And in the same document, further down below, it says the test will be made available on Blackboard on 22nd November at 4 p.m. and you have 72 hours to complete it. Yeah. Sorry, guys. My bad. My mistake. So how are we dealing with it? Well, I thought you shouldn't be punished for that because uh, some of you guys planned with the one deadline and some others of you planned with the other deadline. I know you have lots of other essays to happen so that, that all go on in, uh, at this time. So actually what we're going to do with it, uh, the test will just be available for longer. Uh, it is actually available now already. You can start it, but as the very last submission date, I use the last date that was somewhere mentioned in the document. Right? So effectively you have more time to that. Don't let that mean, don't let that drop it then, I don't know, because it can be easy because now you have like, I don't know, instead of three days, you have six days, you can easily forget about it, you know, get it out of the way. It's not too much to be done, but um, as some of you might have planned differently, I don't want to punish you for it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's online, so do it. Yeah. Um, okay, so talking more about networks, so this is what I brought with me for today. Uh, first of all, I venture off a little bit, you know, talk about distances and centrality, and hopefully you'll see why I talk about that, because I want to set up the scene for this friendship paradox, you know, this weird little phenomena that your friends have more friends than you have. And then afterwards, I can actually extend this. Actually, this is where you truly made a contribution to the literature, where I said, guys, uh, this extends to other features as well. It means your friends are also better looking than you, on average. Yeah. I like to give that talk in front of established scholars, just give it in their face. Say, guys, I'm really sorry, but your friends look better than you. Yeah. And they tend to have more friends than you too. And if one of them argues against it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing because it's pure logic. It has to be like that. It has to be like that. Yeah. But we'll get to that, and after that, you have a cute little story to tell your friends the next time you're in the pub. Yeah. So after all, what is sociology all about? It's about being able to tell some good stories yeah? about the world, about the society. Today you get a good one. Okay, so let me first talk about distances. Distances, distances and paths, and you know, it becomes a little technical now, and you know, just I want to see that you see where this can go, right? But also, you know, the concepts behind it, you know, like, Folks like me, we think about these things all the time. So distances. Maybe you came across this phenomenon of six degrees. Anybody came across the phenomenon of six degrees? Yeah, you heard about that? Uh, actually, there's a book by Duncan Watts, who's a big figure in that field. It's a nice book. But then there are other books by, uh, I, I don't know, Albert Laszlo Barabashi. He's like a big figure in that, linked or connected. Actually, all three of them are really big dudes in social network analysis. And actually, you know, Barabashi and, and Watts, they are originally physicists, turn, turned sociologists. Christakis, he's in the medical science, but he's actually also some sociologist in a way. But they're all like big guys, you know, like, like, like big, big household names. But they all three wrote popular science books. So these are the kind of books that you would pick up at the airport. If you like the kind of science, it's actually great. You know, I have so many of these books because I actually tend to spend time at airports. 
So, uh, so they are they are all easy to understand. Yeah, but at the same time, this is written by the real folks, right? So they know what they are talking about. So what do we mean with six degrees? Well, it's this weird phenomena that apparently, supposedly, you can connect any two people in the world through six friendship relationships. That's kind of weird. That means like you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, and that guy knows that guy in Tasmania. Or, I don't know, that is that guy who's currently at the Arctic Circle, yeah? or in the research station at the South Pole. It's kind of really weird. We have like seven billion people on the world, but still with six steps, you're, you're reaching everybody? Yeah? How the hell does that work? Well, actually, it works through this something that is called the small world phenomenon. Yeah? There's big literature on small worlds. Basically, it means that our world is in such a way that most of your friends are sort of connected amongst each other. Yeah? They're sort of like groups of friends. But then you have like a random link to this one guy outside somewhere yeah? that none of your friends knows. But I happen to know, I don't know, somebody who actually lives in Singapore right now. Yeah? So we have some common history or whatnot. But it's this one link that none of my friends here knows that guy. So I'm, I'm close with my friends over here, but I have this long range tie to somebody in Singapore. And that, that guy over there in Singapore, he has actually lots of people that he knows locally, right? And one of those people that he knows has this long-range tie to somebody in Alaska. Yeah. So that's sort of how this, how this works. And, and people actually show this is where Duncan Watts, he made a big contribution. 1998 is quite a few years old, but it was like a big paper in science. He published that. Um, that with starting from a structure where people are locally connected with their friends, right? Your friends are friends with each other. Starting with something like that, a few random links suffice. Just a few of those random ties that kind of cross net, they suffice to generate this situation where people can reach everybody else very quickly. But at the same time, they maintain what we call local clustering. Yeah, meaning like your friends know each other. It seems like we all know each other, right? And we call that high local clustering. But at the same time, you can reach a random person very quickly because one of you will have that random link. Finally, when you introduce more and more of these random links, the thing doesn't work anymore. That's kind of really weird. You need to have the local structure to basically make this. Think of this like airports. You have like one big connection to the big hub, right? And then from there, you have the small little planes that fly around in that area, in a way. If you only have long connections, you get somewhere, but you cannot get people locally anymore. But if you only have people locally, you cannot make those long Long haul flights, basically. So it's like, a, it's like one of those fascinating things, right? If you, if, you include, if you increase the number of random ties, the thing doesn't work anymore. So it's this combination of local clustering and some <coughs> random links. So this thing was also made popular. Uh, anybody ever heard of the Oracle of Bacon? Yeah? Well, there's Kevin Bacon as an, as an actor. That's an actor. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of played in a couple of movies. I can't remember. God. Um, but he actually became, he became known for the Oracle of Bacon. First, he didn't really like it, yeah? but later on he realized Hannah is actually pretty cool. So it's this actor you know, that played in some movies, and now um, we can put down any other actor. Yeah? Let, me, let me put down one of my favorite actors down there. So Liam Nielsen. And as it turns out, Kevin Bacon played in Picture Perfect, Oh, with Katie Kuko, I didn't didn't know that she was you know had a life before, uh, 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 before some other series, um, and she kind of acted together with Liam Neeson in the movie A Million Ways to Die in the West. Right? So now we can actually connect Kevin Bacon to Liam Neeson through co-appearances in movies with other actors. So we could put in other actors in there. I don't know. Somebody give me a name. Clint Eastwood. Okay, so they don't have a direct connection, but apparently Clint Eastwood co-appeared with John Goodman in Trouble with the Curve. And John Goodman co-appeared with Kevin Bacon in the 2009 movie Beyond All Boundaries. But as you can imagine, there are actually there could be lots of connections. Right? There could be two different ways, three different, uh, multiple ways to connect people with each other. Right? 
And this is, this is already what we call a path. Actually, this is the shortest path, a short, the fastest possible way to connect two people with each other. That's the shortest path. Right? And the shortest path is used for the small world phenomena and so on. Okay. So now as we are academics, you know, there's actually uh, the academic version of this, which is great, started with a guy called Paul Erdos. Anybody knows Paul Erdos? Well, he was a physicist, mathematician, Hungarian at the time, you know. And, um, but he was very important for networks. Now, he's the guy who basically invented random networks, if you can say it. So, I don't know. Uh, but, um, so, so he, people said, okay, academics, we care about our publications. We care about writing books or writing journal articles, and we co-author with other people, right? So I have lots of co-authors. So you can say, okay, if you co-authored directly with Paul Erdos, for mathematicians that's important, they say you have an Erdos number of one. If you have a co-author who co-authored with Paul Erdos, you have an Erdos number of two, and so on, right? So now we can extend that, and we can actually combine, find links between, between any, any two uh, sociologists. So um, give me a name. Give me a sociologist. Thomas Grund. <laughs> Actually, I am in the database because I tend to publish. Yeah. Um, let's find somebody else. Somebody for let's say who is relevant for this class. Let's find James Coleman. Or oh, Shannon could have been interesting. Yeah? Let's check Shannon next time. So uh, James Coleman. So apparently there is a link. Uh, it's, it's a pretty lousy link. Let's face it. I haven't published that much. I haven't published with James Coleman. Uh, truth said, the guy is dead for the last I don't know 25 years. Yeah? Um, but, you know, I happened to publish with a guy called Carlo Moselli. Then he published with a guy called, I don't know, uh, Skillicon, who published with this guy Wang, who published with this person Shang, and then again another Wang, and then finally co-authored with James Cole. Yeah. Actually, now I want to know if there's a link to Shelling. I think it's not in the database. That's kind of weird. I'm in the database, but the Nobel Prize winner isn't. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> well, he's an economist, so maybe, I don't know, this is limited. He must be in there. Esther, Esther, yeah. Probably there's a connection. Oh, no connection. No connection to you on Esther. Yeah. So there's no possible way of linking you on Esther with me. Yeah. Okay, so these are actually what we call shortest paths and distances. And these kind of things, they are actually quite important in network analysis because a lot of things are actually based on these kind of things, right? Uh, now you see again, like this is now our shortest path to link two nodes with each other, like node number 15 to number 17. Because now you can say, okay, who would I have to visit, right? Who would I have to go through to make these shortest paths, to make these links, right? And, and actually, then one way of thinking about you know, importance is thinking about people who, who actually are important to link other people with each other, in a way. Yeah? That's sort of like one of the ideas. We have distances, if you want to know, you know this is like a brief book, so you know this, but maybe some of you actually might want to know this. Uh, how, do you, how do you calculate these kind of things? Yeah? Actually, this is where matrix algebra comes into play. It's nothing too fancy, you just multiply the matrix by itself, and that kind of tells you who you can reach in two steps. And you get that, and if you kind of multiply that with the matrix again, then you get who you can reach in three steps, and so on and so forth. Right? So it's like a, like a simple, simple way of deriving that. At the end of the day, you can derive a distance matrix. Now that's what you see here now. And you know, when you think about, I don't know, a network being there, there we have a small little network with five nodes, and now you see a distance matrix that has five rows and five columns. And now these numbers tell us how many steps does it take to get from the row actor to the column actor. So when I go, for example, to this, uh, to this one here, it says from actor number two, I need to take one step to reach actor number one. Right here we are, actor number two. Indeed, that's one, one arrow over there. Right, for example, from, uh, let's say, from actor number two to actor number three, there's a two here, that means it takes two steps 
two to three, you see, okay, actually you can go from two to one, and then from one to three, and this is the fastest possible one. If you can see, actually there's another path to connect two to three, you can go from two to four, and then from four to one, and then from one to three, but that's more that that's not the shortest path anymore. Now that takes three steps, while the other one takes only two steps. So this is sort of a distance matrix, you know, that we can calculate and, you know, and, and then you can do all sorts of things with that, you know, and use that and, I don't know, are they similar or not? Are they further away in the attributes? These are the kind of questions that, that I ask when I have, when I, when I do papers. Okay, so these are distances. The next thing I want to talk about is centrality. And this is sort of where, why I'm talking about these distances to begin with, because they sort of are important when we talk about centrality. And centrality is a big concept in network analysis. It really like, captures this idea that centrality importance in the network matters. That's a very basic idea, meaning that we are not just isolated. The who you know matters for whatever. For last time I told you uh, about ground and weather for getting a job, maybe. Yeah? Well, as it turns out, it also matters for status, for being better informed. But how would we capture these kind of things? And what does well-connected actually mean? I think in this graph, this little graph, this little small little graph, a network, you see five nodes. I guess we could all agree that person that is best connected is A, right? That guy is in the middle of things, while the other ones are not as well-connected. But how do we actually, what is well-connected? You know, we, now we have an intuition about that, but that's actually the question, what is well-connected? So does anybody have an idea what well-connected could be? Lots of people that you know. It's a very simple one. Actually, it's called degree centrality. I have it up in a second. It's really just you are more connect, you are more central when you have more friends, right? That's a very simple. It's a very simple one. It sounds trivial, but actually there are lots of other concepts. Anybody has another idea? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's, a, that's, a, that's exactly the point where I want to go. Yeah, because let's say we have the same number of friends, but somehow your friends are somehow more important than mine. Yeah? Maybe mine all connects with each other in a way, but your friends are connected all over the world. So we have the same number of friends, but somehow you are, I don't know, somehow better connected in the world. But I'm in my little, little bubble, yeah? while you have, have connections that go out. We have the same number of friends, but obviously there's a difference. Anybody another idea? Well, basically, there's a um, now in the literature there are maybe three or four main centrality measures, and they're all based around this idea. The first one is degree centrality, uh, uh, and the and the other ones are that somehow the other connections also matter, right? Not just how many connections that I have, but somehow also the connections of these connections matter, right? Yeah. The strength of the tie, you know, you're saying there could be a, a difference, you know, I don't know, you could have really close friends while I have very weak friends, right? Or, or maybe, or how do we balance that off? Maybe you have like five really close friends and I have a hundred completely, I don't know, weak acquaintances in a way, right? So how would we deal with that? Actually, in the literature, people talk about, use, the, use uh, uh, tie strength then, but then, you know, we're already at a, at a point where, funnily enough, there was just a couple of years ago where, where the guy who I happen to know, Tom Opsal wrote the paper about exactly this trade-off, like how many friends do you have and how, how strong is the connection, right? Because we have to weigh these things against each other somehow. Do we give more weight to the number of friends that you have or do we give more weight to the actual strength of that <laughs> relationship? Yeah. So valued ties is actually, believe it or not, a research frontier in this whole field. So for most of the longest time, people looked at very simple networks. Is there a connection, yes or no, right? And putting in tie values or strength is like a recent thing where um, I'm actually working on as well. Okay, so there are different ideas about how so somebody is well connected. So we had the earlier suggestions about uh, how many friends you have. It turns out in the literature it's known as degree centrality. It's really just the number of friends that you have. This is now a mathematical formulation. Don't freak out about this. It's really just if you're interested in, I don't know, how these things could go. Because at the end of the day, we can represent the network as a matrix yeah, with, I don't know, 
let's say you have five people, so you have like five rows and five columns, and you have a one when, I don't know, that guy is connected to that guy. You have a zero when that guy is not connected to that guy. Yeah? So you have an n by n matrix, and we call that y. And uh, yeah, it has the underscore i and j. With i, we mean the person, I don't know, in the row. With j, we mean the person in the, in the column. And then if you sum up over all the j's, right, that is like, a, um, uh, 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 that's, that's like, so uh, y i j means like, now I'm summing up over all j's. That means like it's one when I have a connection. Let's say I'm i, and I, it's, it's, it's y, my, y i j is one when I have a connection to actor. It's really just summing up how many people that I name as my friends. While the other, it's called out degree. While in degree is summing up the number of people that name me as their friends. And you see there's a difference between these two things. Okay, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. Here's a little example of that. We have like these, these uh, four individuals. And now you see if I would just do that little thing, if I would create the matrix of that, you see actually the degree centrality of A would be four. That guy has four connections why the degree centrality of the other people would be one, because they have one connection. But they would have no connection, that degree centrality would be zero. Okay, uh, and we have in degree and out degree, when now you see actually this little network, there are no arrows attached to it, yeah, so it doesn't really matter. I don't know, ties coming in, ties going out, it's the same thing, but when there are arrows attached to it, there's a difference. Yeah. There's like, I don't know, directed ties, is how we call them, and then you would calculate, then you can actually, there could be different values for the number of ties that you sent and the number of ties that you receive. Okay, but as I said, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, another idea about well-connected that now, uh, you, you didn't really bring that up yet, but what about this suggestion that I'm well-connected when, when I can reach others very quickly? Right? What if I'm close to others? Somehow I'm in the middle of things. That means I might not have that many friends, but I have the right friends so to spread information the fastest way. Right? So maybe you have five friends, but I, or maybe you have 100 friends, or maybe I have just five friends, but my five friends have 1,000 friends, and your 100 friends only have like one friend each in the extreme scenario. Right? So actually, the information would spread faster if you would give me the information than if, when, if you would have the information. So that's an idea called closeness. And closeness centrality, again, there's like, I don't know, a mathematical way. I don't, I don't want to bore you with that. I don't want to spend too much time on these kind of things. But there's a way how we can calculate that. We can basically calculate how long does it take to get from individual i to j. Now we're talking about the pass, you know, the shortest pass that we just had earlier, you know, the fastest possible way, six degrees, I don't know, or four degrees, or two steps, or one step, or so on. And um, that, if we average that, that would be farness. It would be an average value. If that value, if my value is very low, that means I'm close to everybody else. While if that value would be high, that means I'm far away from everybody else. And if you take the inverse of farness, we already are with closeness centrality. Yeah. But as I said, I don't want to spend too much time on these kind of things. It's a little thingy, but let's not do that. That's all of between the centrality. Between the centrality captures this idea that I'm sort of in the middle of paths that connect other people. Yeah. So again, I could have only a few number of people, but I'm actually crucial to holding the whole thing together so that information can spread from person A to person B through me. So that's, again, there's an, another idea. There's an op these are all different operationalizations for what is importance in a network, right? or what is centrality of the network. Right? And you, know, you can motivate them differently depending on uh, what you're interested in. That's between the centrality, but I, I, I want to... Go ahead. If you want to know more about that, as it turns out, I'm, I'm currently writing a book on practical things about network analysis with Stata. It's a book that should have been published ages ago, but it hasn't. And if I actually probably would have had that published, I would have that link with you on Esther. Because Peter Hesser, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he has something with you on Esther. Yeah. Okay. But I want to go on, and I want to talk now about the friendship paradox. And maybe now, then you see where these centrality things come into play. Right? Because you could use these centrality, and people have done a lot of work uh, you know, identifying important people in the network. You know, for example, you know, I'm working with the police here, and we want to identify who are the important criminals that we would have to knock out. Right? Take that guy out, and it disrupts the network. It's actually pretty cool. Yeah? Or you could even think about who would you have to take out 
in order for the network to change in such a way that it's actually, it's, it's like trying to be a step ahead. Yeah? Trying to stay, stay ahead, because you cannot take out the whole thing. Think about terrorist networks. You cannot take out the whole thing. But what you can do is you can take out the guys that connect things. Right? So finally, I have actually a lot of former colleagues, they now work for the, I don't know, US uh, military or for the secret service and shit. You know? And that's exactly what they do. They do network analysis to try to target uh, terrorist networks. So, uh, but it can also be uh, important to target vulnerable groups. Right? So in this project that I have with, uh, with the police here in, in Ireland, with the, with the Gadi, uh, we try to look at um, young people who are vulnerable. Right? And here the idea is their networks matter. Right? If those guys are connected, sort of are so in the middle of things, they are more vulnerable to things that happen to them. Or we could even hope to identify who is more likely to move up in the ladder, right, once they are, once they are there. <coughs> Fascinating stuff. Fascinating research about crime networks. Okay, but what I want to talk about is the friendship paradox. Friendship paradox, that now we're talking about this article that you guys had to read for today. Scott Feld, yeah, paper published in the American Journal of Sociology, 1991. Fascinating paper. The guy, Scott Feld, you know, he's like an interesting character. In my opinion, he does really really on-off work. So I've seen him now a couple of times at conferences. Some of his stuff I, I love, like this paper. Uh, or he also wrote a paper about fo social foci. It means like we, we, we come together because we have similar interests. That means we meet each other. And then, I don't know, at the end we have similar, you have ties between people with similar interests. You know, right? But sometimes the guy also does bonkers stuff. So I've seen him at presentations and I thought, what the hell is Scott trying to tell us? Yeah. Anyway, so in this paper he talks about this Thing that on average your friends have more friends than you do. On average your friends have more friends than you do. That doesn't mean that it's always the case. Yeah? So I don't know, there will be some of you that have uh, uh, more friends than your friends. Yeah? But if I would ask people here about you know, how many friends you have, and then for each one of you I would probe about your friends and how many friends their friends have, right, and kind of compare these two numbers with each other, it's not that half of you would have more and half of you would have less friends than your friends. Actually, this, this would be shifted in one direction. Yeah. And you, you'll see this in a second, why that is the case. OK. So the, the basic idea of this is that individuals with many friends show up in more friendship relationships. It's very simple. If you have 1,000 friends, 1,000 people will see you. Right? But if you only have five friends, only five people will see you as their friends. So in the first case, if you have a thousand friends, a thousand friends of yours will, will actually know that you have 999 other friends. While if you only have five friends, one of your friends will only know that you have four other friends. So that means that kind of, it's essentially, it's a, it's a, I have a little video about this later on, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of sampling, that the people who have more connections, they are actually more, more present. They are, they are seen by more people, which is this weird thing, you know, that, I don't know, celebrities, you know, on Twitter, they are seen by millions of people, right? While my stupid little Twitter account, which is dormant for years, so don't try to think of anything, it's just really dead, I don't care about it anymore, yeah. Um, nobody cares, yeah, but also nobody sees, yeah, so, um, and actually, as it turns out, most of the people have far fewer followers on Twitter than the people that whom they follow. It's one of those weird things where our society is sort of biased in a way. So, so how, can that, how can that be? Well, I say it has to be. It's actually deductive logic. It really has to be. So here's now the example that Feld uses in, in the paper. It's a small little network from a high school. You know, you see those guys, and uh, you see the names of those individuals. Now you see numbers attached to them. The first number that you see is really just the number of friends that they have. Yeah, so Betty has one friend, that's Sue. Pam has three friends, Sue, Carol, and Alice, for example. That's what this first number outside of the parentheses means. Yeah. It's very simple. Jane has two friends, Dale has three friends, and so on. Okay, now what do the things in the parentheses mean? Well, these are the average number of their friends. Average number of their friends. So how would that go? Well, you know, uh, um, for Betty, Betty only has one friend, Sue, and Sue has four friends. That's why there's a four. Right. While for Sue, Sue has actually three friends. So Sue has Betty, Pam, and Dale, 
Now, if I would add that up, 1 plus 3 plus 3, then I end up at 7, and I would divide that by 3, I end up here with, uh, with I'm missing Alice, I was wondering, something is odd. <laughs> Somehow my math didn't work out. Yeah. Okay, so if I would add Dale 3 plus Betty 1 plus, uh, plus Pam, I'm at 7, and then I'm at Alice, and I'm at 11, and I would divide that by 4, I end up with 2.74. That's sort of how these numbers come about. Yeah? So this number is now the average number of friends that Sue's friends have. Okay, but I have here a little more example to, to walk you through that. This is really just now from the paper that, uh, that Felt had written. There's like a, like a table that he has in there, and, and the network is on the left-hand side. So let's focus on Jane. Uh, Jane has two friends. I'm sure you have more friends. Yeah? But in the example here now, you have two friends. So Jane has two friends. Um, there we go, Dale and Alice. Right, here we go, Jane has two friends, Dale and Alice, you see them over there. Now we could look up how many friends do Dale and Alice have. Dale has three friends, Alice has four friends. Question? Yeah? Yeah, I'm just looking at this figure of 91, so like with the advent of the actual social media, do you think that that would be reflected in people's responses? Because they may not have the physical property, like they might not have that closeness that you're talking about, but would they actually consider that person well, well, I'd say it's, um, social media is a very interesting one, and people haven't really looked into that there yet, but we all know the phenomena, I have that phenomena, that on my Facebook, on my Facebook friends' lives, there's so much more going on than in my life. Yeah. And I think, God, what's happening with me? Yeah. But actually, it's this bias, because those where lots of things happen, I'm more likely to see them there. Or with Twitter, it's, it's that thing as well. But, but here, this is now just a very basic thing, you know, about how network structure actually matters when we think about the people around us, right? So coming back to this, I have more about that in a second, but coming back to that, so Dale has three friends and Alice has four friends, there we go, and then, I don't know, um, there we go, these are, these are their friends, these are Dale's friends, these are Alice's friends, three and four, right, and then we can, we can, in total, Jane's friends, Dale and Alice have seven friends in total, now Dale has three and Alice has four, there we go, that's where this number comes from, that's where the seven comes from. And then we can actually divide that because Jane has two friends, right? So the average number of friends that Jane's friends have is 3.5. Yeah? It's a little thinking about my friends and the friends of my friends and so on, right? But it's actually relatively simple, yeah? Okay, and now we can do that for all individuals, right? And there we go, and there we see it now, you see the whole table here, who has how many friends, and how many friends do their average friends have, and now we can take the average over these, so in total, you know, people have 2.5 friends on average, so really just summing up those numbers, 20, and dividing it by the number of people that we have there, we end up with 2.5, but strangely enough, when we kind of sum up the number of friends that the friends have, on average, and divide that by the number of people, we end up with 2.99, which is higher than 2.5. So in this network, on average, friends have more friends than the individuals. It's very strange. Yeah. But it's about something. It's really about if you randomly pick one person. Actually, I think it's fascinating. Actually, I suggested in one of my papers that this could be a genius way of kind of click, of getting to certain people. Right? For example, I suggested this in criminal networks. We want to get to the central individuals. Right? So my simple suggestion, based on this little thing, is don't pick up the random person, but kind of have that person kind of go to somebody and then pick that person up. That person is, even if you know nothing about this network, that second person is likely to be more important than the first one. Because of this weird little thing that a random friend of a random individual is not random anymore. That's kind of weird. But that's because networks, because we have like, because some of you have more friends than others, right? So if I kind of take a random person here and then take a random friend of that person, I'm more likely to end up with one of those guys who has a thousand friends than with the guy who has five friends. Just because there are more ways that lead to the guy who has a thousand friends. That's the thing. So we can actually, the random friend of a random person is not random anymore. And you'll see in a second actually where we can apply that in a fast, there's been a fascinating paper but uh, Christak, by Christakis, say we can actually use that to have better, better predictions of when there's an outbreak of the flu. Yeah. But I come back to that in a second. 
Okay, so now this is sort of like in my paper, I extended this very simple idea with the GRI. Now I kind of extended that to these other centrality measures. And actually, I showed that it applies to these other centrality measures too. Yeah, not just the degree that we talked about earlier, but also the closeness, betweenness, and there's another one, eigenvector centrality, and so on. I mentioned earlier already in Twitter we find this phenomenon as well, that on Twitter, you know, with, I don't know, 6 million users at the time, the friendship paradox holds for almost everybody, yeah. meaning that almost everyone you follow has more friends and followers than you, which is really, but actually the same thing holds for Instagram. And now you see how this actually affects your life. The people that you follow on Instagram are likely to have more followers than you. Right. So actually, they are more likely to get more likes than you anyway, because they are connected to more people, in a way, or they are more likely to that. And you see how this affects our life, because suddenly you sit there and think, oh, my friends, they get all the more likes. Nobody likes me. Yeah. But then you realize, no, there's actually a paradox here. This is the virality or the activity paradox, or I don't know, based on this friendship paradox, which is, at the end, a sampling problem. So I have a little video that hopefully explains this for those of you who are still kind of struggling with it a little bit. It's just thinking a little bit around the corner. Your friends are probably more popular than you are. And it's not just you either. I can say this with a lot of certainty because this actually applies to most people. But it's not really a bad thing. Let me explain. First, we need to understand that, oddly enough, comparing yourself to your friends is not that accurate a comparison. For instance, people with few friends are not that likely to appear in your list of friends, but much more likely to exist in the general public. In statistics, this is called sampling bias. In other words, the sample of people you're comparing yourself to is biased compared to people in general. There are relatively more people with lots of friends and relatively fewer people with not a lot of friends. But the question still remains, how can most people's friends be more popular than them? Wouldn't we run out of people if we continue this trend? Well, you have to remember that people can count more than once if we take a step back. Looking back at the web of friends from earlier, it seems that this person over here makes five people seem less popular. But this person over here? They don't influence anyone's numbers. As a general statement, the more friends you have, the more averages you influence, and so the effect applies without us ever running out of people. So next time you find yourself saddened by how many more friends everybody seems to have, just remember, it's all probably just a bit of math trickery. Your friends are- Okay, so yeah, that's kind of weird. So your friends tend to have, on average, more friends than you have. It, it really comes down to this very simple fact that people with lots of friends, they are seen by more people as having more friends. Think about this, all, ro all roads lead to Rome. When there are more roads, I don't know, you, you're more likely to end up in Rome than in my tiny little village in South West of Germany. Yeah. Anyway, so um, I actually extended on this. So actually there's a paper uh, in the extended reading list uh, um, where I kind of not only looked at um, degree centrality, but I extended this to, to, uh, to other forms of centrality. Um, it's one thing, so I looked at networks in the US, you know, like big networks. There's like one example network, so I looked at 14 of these in high schools collected in the US. And, uh, and then I kind of calculated different centrality measures, you know, and the average of it and the average of their, of their friends. And in all of those schools, it was the case that this phenomena holds, it has to hold its logic, you know, it has to be, but I kind of showed it that it also holds for different um, centrality measures. There's another extension that I had, but I'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a second. So I mentioned earlier that, okay, maybe we can use this weird phenomena. Maybe we can use this weird phenomena that the random friend of a random person is not random anymore. The random friend of a random person is actually more likely to be one of those hubs. That's the story. If you take a randomly selected person, and then you randomly walk in one direction, you are more likely to end up with one of those hubs, one of those guys that connects a lot of people because the guy has lots of ways of getting to that. Because, relatively speaking, when you have the language of sampling bias, there's actually a higher chance to reach that person than having selected that person in the first instance. So now, uh, this is a paper by Chris Takis and others. They look at the flu. They look at the flu, the influenza. Actually, they studied it at, uh, at Harvard. At the time, uh, Chris Takis was at Harvard. And you know they, they really kind of uh, uh, randomly asked uh, people at certain times uh, of the year where they first selected random people, right? And then they also randomly selected a friend of those people. Now the first people were in the random group, like just I don't know out of the college they selected a hundred something students. They were in the random group. They were in the red group, and then they 
ask each one of them to randomly tell them one of their friends. Well, I don't know how exactly they did it, but they kind of randomly selected one of their friends. And these people, then I also like to say the 100 people, they ended up in the friends group. Yeah? So they had 200 people, one in the random group and one in the friends group. All you did is like randomly selected 100 people, and the other group, you basically, from those randomly selected 100 people, you randomly selected one of their friends. So both groups had 100 people at the end of the day. But if you kind of paid attention, it means like those groups are not the same anymore, right? Because we kind of made this random step in the network. Even though it was a random step, we are more likely to be with somebody who is one of those hubs. Yeah. And then they thought, okay, well, if that is the case, if you're more likely to then be with people who have hubs, then if you actually ask them about whether they have the flu, the fact when, when those hubs have the flu, this should give us a better indication when an outbreak is going to happen or not, right? Because those people are connected to lots of other people, so they spread it to lots of other people. While if, I don't know, you, you are there, you have the flu, and you have your two friends, you know, then your two friends might become sick. But not a hundred or a thousand people might become sick. That's the idea behind that. And then they did this. So now they actually, you see this graph, let's look at the left graph, the first and the x-axis they have time, you know, it's really just days from, I don't know, from the winter semester when it started. And on the, on the one axis you have the cumulative incidence, I don't know, it basically just says how many people got the influenza. Yeah, somehow value, valued and so on, yeah? or, or, or weighted. But really it's just, think about this, how many people got sick of those 100 people. And as it turns out, you know, they are, they are uh, the, in the hubs, in the, in, the, in the friends group, you know, they could, they could actually see that they get sick earlier than the random people. Why? Because they're more connected. So they meet more people, they have more chances to actually get sick at Harvard. Because the virus spreads there, you know, they all spend their time and so on. And you know, it's this fascinating thing where they actually then could predict the outbreak of the influenza earlier. So they could say, okay, something is going to happen now if we kind of look at not at random sample of people, but at a random sample of friends of randomly sampled people. It's like a weird little trick where you can use the fact that networks are there networks matter. We don't know anything about them, but the only thing we know is some people have more friends than others, and by kind of randomly walking from one person to the other, we are likely to end up with a person, of course sometimes you end up with a person who has less friends, right? but actually more often than not you end up with a person who has more friends. It's not a 50-50 split. If you randomly take a step on a network, you're more likely to end up with somebody who has, who has more friends. Okay, so that's the friendship paradox. Your friends tend to have more friends than you on average. Yeah, of course, I always have to say, uh, well, it's not always the case, but it would be the case. Finally, God, I remember I was um, hanging out in a pub once uh, with, a, with a friend of mine. Uh, it was the Bernard Shaw, you know, nice place, you know it. Uh, sitting outside at the bus, you know, pizza, good pizza, I can recommend it. Uh, we were sitting there, I was telling the story to a friend of mine, and uh, she couldn't believe me. She said, Thomas, you're just talking bullshit. Yeah? This is like just completely stupid. So actually what she did, she got up and she asked 20 people, right, uh, how many friends do your friends have and so on. And then some of the people there said, by any chance are you talking with Thomas? Right? So I think they had heard the story before. I tend to repeat myself. Okay, anyway. So this is now the friendship paradox. There's been this paper by Scott Feld, 1991. It's a great read, it's an easy read. You know, I can really highly recommend it if, you like, if you're interested in these kind of things. At the same time, it really thinks around the corner a little bit. It does something different, in a way. And these are the coolest papers. It's somehow think around the corner. Okay. So now the next thing is where, um, basically I made a contribution a couple of years ago, where I thought, hang on a moment. Hang on a moment. There has been actually 30 years of research in social network analysis. There has been 30 years of research where people looked at the relationship between, I don't know, the number of connections that people have yeah, and certain attributes. Let's say, I don't know, being more innovative, being more successful in finding a job, I don't know, or, or even good looks. You know, people kind of studied, like, how do these kind of things relate with how many friends people have? It's a very basic thing, right? And it's been well established that there are lots of these correlations, you know, that there are these things that, that go together uh, with the various things. So I thought, hang on a moment, if that is the case, if that is the case, that there's this correlation between attributes 
and the number of connections that people have. And then we have this weird little thing, like a friendship paradox. But on average, your friends are actually your, your friends are different from you. Wouldn't that also mean that your friends are more likely to have certain attributes? So that's basically the story. So that um, your friends uh, are likely to have certain non-random attributes. Like a, a random friend of a random person has non-random attributes. Yeah, that's kind of strange. But it's also pretty cool. So when your friends are more likely to have more friends than themselves, um, so, or, or than you, and people with more friends tend to have certain attributes, if you take these two things together, it's pure logic that dictates that your friends are likely to be more important, but also having these different attributes, like being more successful and better, being better looking than you. So again, it's like this friendship paradox at the core of it, that your friends have more friends on average than you have. And somewhere else, we kind of showed that people with more friends, they have different attributes in whatever way that came about. That means that on average, your friends actually are, have different attributes than you when you combine these two things together. So, and this is what I then, I don't know, simulated in this paper, you know, it's just, I don't know, a, a fixtures attribute X, and I kind of correlated that uh, and kind of looked at how would that play out, but actually you might like to see this one, where I actually did an empirical study on this. So I thought, okay, let's, let's, let's do this, let's push this. Yeah? So I actually randomly selected public Facebook profiles, including the profile pictures of people. So I actually collected a thousand randomly selected Facebook profiles. You don't want to know how I got hold of that data, you know? kind of fell off the truck somewhere. Well, it was a leaked data set about, uh, about Facebook profiles, which is why I can't publish this at all, but it's still cool. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I kind of just randomly sampled out of a billion, billion data sets that I had in there, I just randomly sampled 1,000 people. And I looked at their profile picture. And then for each one of those 1,000 people, I kind of randomly selected one of their friends and also looked at their profile picture. So I had now two groups of people, the random group with their profile pictures and the friend group with their profile pictures. Right? I didn't know anything else about their networks. I just knew, I didn't even know who had more friends. Well, actually later on I did look at that. Yeah? But one was like the randomly selected group and the other one was the randomly selected friends of those randomly selected people. Right? So the random group and the friend group. And then I looked at their profile picture and they actually set up a little website. So the website was called wholooksbetter.net doesn't exist anymore, sadly. It was a cool design, you know, it was a cool design. So I set up this website where I then mixed these 2,000 profile pictures together. I scrambled them. And then randomly two of them were kind of selected. And then I had students at Stockholm University play the little game of clicking left or right, like who looks better. Right? They love playing that game. Yeah. Actually, I even smuggled in a few sociologists in there, right? just for the fun of it. So actually, the bald guy on the left is a co-author of mine. Yeah. <laughs> Just because I thought it was funny. Yeah. Anyway, and this is now the result. So what do you see? Well, now you see here, so I had like these pairs, right? people in the random group, and I had one of their friends in the, in the red group, right? both randomly selected, just in the case of one of the friends. And your intuition tells you that, I don't know, in half of the cases, the one person should look better, in the other half, the other person should look better. Right? No, isn't the case. There you see, actually, in well, almost 53% of the times, the friend of the random person, the random friend of the random person, look better than the random person. Okay. So this is sort of empirical evidence that suggests that your friends are not only have more friends than you, but they tend to also be better looking than you. So I repeated that, actually. So where is this coming from? Well, now you see here the distribution of friends that people have. And you see them for the friends group, and you see them for the, for, for the random group. And there you actually see, this is actually really shows the crooks of the thing. You see that the red bars, they are further to the right, meaning that people in the friends group, they actually tend to have more friends than people in the green group, the randomly selected people. That's what's driving that. That combined with a small correlation between number of friends and attractiveness. So I repeated that as a good social scientist. I repeated that with data on weight. So in this case, I kind of used a public data set on this on Pockage, not Pockage, Pockage, a Slovakian social network site with uh, uh, I don't know, over half a million entries. And again, I had like randomly selected people 
and randomly selected friends of these people, and I looked at their weight. And similar result that people in the friend group, they tended to be, on average, heavier than people in the random group. So not only are your friends better looking than you, but they also are in better shape than you. OK, so what is driving that? Again, it's sort of like this distribution, and we see now the distribution number of friends that we have, like in the friend group, they have, tend to have more friends than people in the random group. So anyway, so on that note, you have a story to tell your friends in the Bernard Shaw when you eat your pizza, and no reading for next week. We have a review session next week, and I talk about the assignment. Yeah? Okay.